Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at Morphe's with this behemoth of an awesome piece of equipment. This is a uh, US Navy Mark 22 double gun mount. This holds a pair of Browning water-cooled 50 caliber machine guns. These were manufactured from 1942 until the end of World War II in 1945 and they were actually made by a company uh, here in Pennsylvania. They were made by Heinz Manufacturing of Philadelphia. Now, a few basic specs on this thing. Overall, weighs 825 pounds. This was originally designed as a deck mount for boats, for ships. So this whole thing would be bolted down solid to the, the deck of a vessel where you didn't have to worry about recoil and balance and everything like that. Uh, they were also used for fixed emplacements on land, however. So the Navy originally adopted this as the Mark 22. It was an improvement over their Mark 21 mount, which only held a single gun. This, of course, holds two. And then in 1943, the Army took a look at this and went, well, that looks uh, pretty sweet. We'd kind of like to have some of those ourselves as well. And so the Army adopted it as the M46 uh, in exactly, as far as I can tell, the exact same configuration as the Navy mount. Uh, this would be, there would be a second one adopted by the Army in 1944, uh, the M64, and that was set up to use uh, air-cooled guns instead of water-cooled guns. The water-cooled 50 calibers were not as prevalent as the, the standard M2HB air-cooled guns that people are much more familiar with. But there were a lot of these in service. There were a lot of them that got made, and if you have a fixed emplacement where you're not trying to move the guns around, well, why not water cool it? You've got a substantial amount of firepower in this thing to deal with, and that's gonna generate a lot of heat. So let's look at a few of these specific design elements here. So first off, the guns. There are a pair of uh, water-cooled Browning 50s back here. They're both mounted into the gun on spring-loaded reciprocating mounts. And the easiest way to see those mounts is actually to look up from the bottom of the gun. So you can see right there, we have the a forward and a rearward spring, and there is an oscillating slide right here. So the gun is mounted to this mechanism in the center. So when it fires, it'll bounce back and forth without directly transferring all of its recoil into the mount. The guns are fitted with the same sort of spade grips you would get on a standard M2HB, so these each have thumb triggers in them. The gunner is going to push himself into these padded shoulder rests and have one hand on each gun to fire them. So they can be fired singly or simultaneously. Now, the mount is capable of full 360 degree rotation. It can depress as much as negative 10 degrees, useful if you're trying to fire down off the deck of a large vessel, um, and it can elevate up to 80 degrees. Now, especially at 80 degrees, it's gonna get a little funky for the gunner to try to stay positioned with the gun. And so that's why you've got this. This is actually a, basically a web belt that hooks the gunner onto the gun. It's attached via a couple of quick detach, oops, very quick detach clips here. Hook that back on. And the gunner would simply belt himself in like so, and then he can lean back and uh, just put his weight into the gun. Makes it a lot easier to, to hang with this thing and maneuver it around. There is an elevation lock here and if I loosen that up, there we go. Then we can pivot the gun, guns up and down as well as rotating them around. Now the balance at the moment is a little funky. Um, this wants to pivot backwards and I suspect it's because there's no water in the jackets of the guns. Once you put that water in, I bet this balances really just about perfectly. All right, ammo. It's gonna be an important element, right? We've got two machine guns. We're gonna to wanna to feed them as much as possible. The largest capacity drums that were available for the M2 were these 200 round tombstone, named obviously for their shape, drums. Now you can also hook these, fit these up with just plain uh, ammo cans that will hold 100 rounds of belted ammo. These guys, we can lift right off, and the way these work is 
open these two clips, pivot the drum open, and we have a winding spool here on the top half. You would take you would take your belt of 200 rounds, clip the one end of it on here, wind it up, and you can probably fit about 80, maybe 90 rounds on this spool. You then take the rest of the belt, drop it into the bottom of the drum, and just wind it up back and forth. At the end, the uh, belt comes out here where it feeds into the gun. And note that there is a little spring-loaded clip here to prevent the belt from going backwards. Now the reason for this weird combination of just laying the ammo in and having some on a spool is that if you had a 200 round deep belt box, by the time you got to the bottom of it, the weight of the ammo belt that was going to be pulled up and over this 90 degree roller would be enough to potentially cause problems. So what this does is it maximizes the amount you can get simply by stacking a belt in the can and then you can get more ammo in by having it on this spool which, once this is closed, the bit on the spool is going to feed around here and then straight out. Now, of course, the winding reel, the winding handle here, just slides out, and you would not have this on while you're firing the thing or else this is gonna spin around and probably fall out. The armor plate here is 3 eighths of an inch thick, and it is hardened armor plate, not just plain mild steel. That will easily stop 30 caliber gunfire. It'll probably do a pretty darn good job stopping 50 caliber, as well as all manner of shrapnel and other projectiles. A few features on here, of course, this is the bracket to hang the tombstone drums, or just a plain tray that will hold a 50 cal ammo can. You've got these knuckles that are welded in because this is where the charging handle of the gun is. So I can reach in there and charge the gun and still have armor protection for my hand and of course some armor protection for bits of the gun that stick out to the side. Got a hole for sights. We'll take a look at the sights in just a moment. Right here we have uh, the empty brass chute. So the M2 is going to eject brass vertically down out the bottom of the gun. It'll come into this chute, brass will come out, it'll then hit this and drop straight down the front of the mount so that you're not spraying brass around. Links are going to come out the side of the gun here and here, and they're just gonna fall down the center and clatter harmlessly off the armor. I should also point out that these are left and right hand guns. So we have one, the one on the left feeds from the left, the one on the right feeds from the right. That was one of the cool features of the Browning 50 is that it was really easy on a universal standard receiver to um, adapt the guns to fire from either side. Now, sights. You'll see there that the front sights remain on these guns, but the standard infantry rear sights have been removed and just covered over with solid plates. We have a little covered compartment here where we can stow our anti-aircraft spider sights. Once those are mounted on the gun, we get a setup like this, pretty standard for anti-aircraft sights, and these were predominantly used for the anti-aircraft roll. So the whole point of a spider sight like this is that the circles are about aircraft velocity, and then these are, of course, direction of travel, because the, the key element in anti-aircraft shooting is getting the proper lead. Bullets take time to travel, and you have to shoot in front of your target, not where your target is now, so that the bullet intersects with the aircraft. Um, and so these, these are actually pretty, they look just sort of like you just draw some circles. These are actually pretty carefully calibrated so that at a specific range and a specific speed, these three concentric circles will give you proper uh, leads. And part of the process of becoming a good anti-aircraft gunner is understanding those and being able to estimate distance and speed of aircraft. All right, you can actually get a really good view of this through the camera. So the rear sight just has a plain crosshair, which you would then line up with whatever element of the spider front sight you're trying to aim on. Now you'll notice this view looks awfully dark. That's because there are actually a pair of tinted lenses here that you can use. So if you're shooting up into the sun, classic air, air attack tactic is to attack out of the sunlight, while the gunner can engage one or both of these lenses so that they can actually look at an oncoming aircraft. And there's also some adjustability here with this wheel 
I can move the whole site forward and backward so that whatever fits me with these shoulder rests, I can bring the site to the appropriate uh, point for my own physiology. So this may not be the absolute coolest M2 mount ever made. That honor would probably have to go to the fully powered and articulated quad gun turret that was used all the way through the Vietnam War. But this one's pretty darn cool. And it's even cooler given that it comes with a pair of water-cooled, fully transferable, registered legal M2 heavy machine guns on it. So no batteries required, no power required. Pretty sweet. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.